This puzzle stumped everyone I've showed it to. In a 1x1 one one square, place a point called a site and color the square. Now add another site, but color only where the new site is closer than the first. Red areas are closer to the first site, and blue ones are closer to the second. Each new site forms a cell where the new site is the closest site to areas in that cell. This is called a Voronoi diagram. My question is, in a Voronoi diagram with n random sites, what is the average perimeter of a random cell in terms of n? I challenged my viewers to solve this problem in a previous video, and after reviewing what they sent to me and doing some of my own work on the problem, I can say we conclusively figured out that the answer is extremely difficult to prove. But everyone is sure they know the answer, experimental data appears to match a very simple formula that comes from a simplified version of the problem. What I want to show you in this video is that working on a really hard math problem often leads to unexpected discoveries. The collection of viewer submitted responses you're about to see will prompt us to rediscover a fundamental geometric quantity and ask questions about how circles overlap with squares. If our formula is indeed correct, it implies that this crazy 5-dimensional integral roughly equals 4 over n to the 3 halves plus n. Along the way, I hope you'll gain a newfound appreciation for how mathematical exploration steers you towards uncovering mysteries far beyond the question you initially set out to answer. To get our bearings, let's first change the question just a little bit and ask for the average area of a cell instead of the average perimeter. Many viewers realized that this is actually pretty straightforward to answer. The key thing to notice is the order in which sites are added is completely arbitrary, meaning we can think about any one of these cells to represent the average. If there are n cells, then because all of them together fill up the whole area of the square, which is 1, we can expect any individual cell to, on average, take up an area of 1 over n. You can make this rigorous in several different ways. We're already making some good progress, but there's an issue. For the case of area, we know that all the areas together add up to 1, the area of the unit square. But it's hard to find an analogous argument for the perimeters, since we don't know for sure what the total perimeter of all the Voronoi cells is. For example, here's a diagram where the total perimeter of all the cells is 6, but if we move the sites like this, the total increases to 4 plus 2 square root of 2, about 6.83. Something we can do to get a foothold is find the minimum and maximum possible perimeters for a cell. Many of you identified a way to achieve this. If the sites go in a diagonal line towards one of the corners, for example, this cell has a perimeter that can be arbitrarily close to 0, but this other cell has a perimeter that can be arbitrarily close to 4, the perimeter of the unit square containing everything. So whatever answer we come up with from now on should always be between 0 and 4, no matter how many sites there are. Keep these bounds in mind for a bit later. For now, let's do something that will seem like a wild oversimplification. Pretend that all of the sites happen to perfectly fit into a grid pattern like this, causing all cells to be squares of equal size. Here we know the exact area of any cell is 1 over n, since there are n squares and the total area is 1. The perimeter of a square is simply 4 times one of its side lengths, which in this case is the square root of its area, 1 over n, giving us 4 over square root of n. Now clearly this is not going to be quite right. Random Voronoi diagrams are not going to look like a perfect grid of squares. But in a moment, we're going to put our estimate to the test with a computer simulation. So I want you to pause the video here and make a guess as to how well the formula 4 over square root of n approximates the true average perimeter of a cell. Do you think it's greater or less than 4 over square root of n, and why? Put your answer in the comments below. To run an experiment with the computer, we'll use some Python libraries to compute the locations of vertices in the Voronoi diagrams from a set of site locations. Really quickly, I just want to point out that figuring out an algorithm to do this yourself is a really fun challenge, and I'd highly recommend you give it a try. A couple of my viewers created some different ways to visualize this process, 
and I also chose to do it from scratch to make the animations for this video. A subtask for the method I used involves the picture you're seeing on screen. Comment below if you think you know what you're looking at here. Alright, let's make a graph. On the horizontal axis, we have n going from 1 up to 500. Now for each of those values of n, we'll let the computer create hundreds of different Voronoi diagrams with n sites and find the average perimeter of a cell. I'm going to overlay the curve f of n equals 4 over square root of n so you can see how well it approximates our experimental results. Okay, so for n equals 1, well, the answer here isn't anything special. The single cell will always just have a perimeter of 4, the border of the unit square containing it. But for the next few samples, huh, those all seem to be pretty close to the yellow curve too. And the rest of the points? Whoa, this is not what I guess would have happened. I mean, in all fairness, 4 over square root of n can't possibly be too bad of an approximation. After all, it stays between 0 and 4 when n is greater than 1, which as we saw earlier is the widest range of values for a cell's perimeter. So I could draw any old downward trending curve here that starts at 4 and approaches 0 as n gets large, and it'll be a reasonably good fit. But it seems like these two curves really do match up almost perfectly. The picture becomes much clearer if I multiply the heights of each of the points by square root of n for each of their respective n's. Here you can see that the data kicks up a bit for small values of n, but then converges down to a constant of 4, suggesting that it fits well with 4 over square root of n. Now some of you may be thinking, well maybe it's not so surprising that assuming all of the cells look like squares is a good approximation given that the overall bounding region of the Voronoi diagram itself is a square. So let's do the test again, this time where the bounding region is a circle. And to make things fair, we'll create the circle with the same area as the square, which is 1. Back on our plot, let's again graph the average perimeter times the square root of n for the circular boundary. For n equals 1, we just get the circumference of a circle with an area of 1, which is 2 square root of pi, or about 3.54. But again, as n gets bigger and bigger, the same approximation, 4 over square root of n, seems to get better and better. Something fun you can try is doing this with different shapes for a bounding region. I did a test using a regular hexagon, for example, and got the same result. There appears to be something fundamental about 4 over square root of n that describes the average perimeter of Voronoi cells. This was actually discovered almost a hundred years ago. A 1953 paper by Meiring in Phillips Research Reports analyzes many theoretical properties of Voronoi diagrams in the context of physical crystal structures. This was before we had computers. On page 284, he includes a reference to an experiment by Scheele and Wurst from 1936 that finds the exact same formula we just did by growing crystals in a piece of iron. But I believe this result, like ours, is purely an empirical one, and I didn't find a mathematical proof for it anywhere. What's weird to me about all of this is that using a grid of squares to make our approximation was in many ways an arbitrary choice. We could have just as well done this assuming that each cell is an equally sized circle, hexagon, or any other shape. Albeit for the case of a square bounding region, which is what this video focuses on, it's not really possible to make Voronoi diagrams with some of these shapes because of packing. But even for the case of squares, we never pretended that the diagrams actually looked like that either. It was just a tool to make an approximation. Some viewers actually did the approximation with these other shapes to get other formulas that look like something over square root of n. The values in the numerators for these formulas are the square root of a quantity called the compactness factor for a shape. Compactness factor is defined to be a shape's perimeter squared divided by its area. Intuitively, you can think of it as measuring how squished a shape is, with densely packed shapes having a relatively low compactness factor, and more eccentric shapes having a higher compactness factor. Now you may think that because we got such a good approximation using the compactness factor for a square, that perhaps the average Voronoi cell has the same compactness factor as a square. But this isn't actually true. 
One viewer sent me this histogram that plots the compactness factor of random Voronoi cells, finding that the average is about 17.69, just above the value for a square, which is 16. So why is it that the approximation we made using squares seems to represent the behavior of random Voronoi cells so closely? Now let me be clear, there are other very good, perhaps better, approximations. I also received this submission that uses regular hexagons in a version similar to what I was describing a moment ago, and gets a very good fit as well, even accounting for the little bump at the start we saw in our data earlier when you multiply by the square root of n. It ultimately converges down to 4 over square root of n as n gets large. With all of this in mind, let's try to mathematically prove an exact formula. And as a little spoiler, we're about to do some pretty complicated math, but the culmination of the next few minutes of the video will result in a derivation of this 5-dimensional integral expression as the answer to our question. We'll start off simple with three randomly placed sites. What I want to focus on is, on average, how long will the border be between the blue and gold cells? Reasoning about the border between cells will help us with the perimeter later. Note that in many cases, cells will have a border of zero, but if the blue and gold cells border each other at all, any part of that border lies completely on the perpendicular bisector of the line that goes between the sites. But only some of these points are actually included in the border. The red part is colored from a different site. To tell if a point is going to be included, imagine a circle centered at the point just big enough that it touches the two sites. I'll let you pause the video here if you'd like to think about what comes next. The third site here is outside of the circle. If it was within the circle, then the point wouldn't be on the border because it would be closer to that third site than the other two sites. But otherwise, the closest site is a tie between these two, hence making the point on the border. With many other sites, they all have to land in the region not covered by the circle. As long as that is the case, our green point will be included in the border. But if I move even just one of these other sites within the circle, that's no longer true. Finding the average length of this border will be helpful in finding the average perimeter of a cell, and to do that, it'll be useful to know the probability that the point is included in the border, or that no other site lies within this circle. Since all the sites are randomly placed, the chance of any one site landing outside of the circle is the fraction of the area of the square that this circle doesn't cover. This is 1 minus the area of the circle that falls within the square. Each other site must be outside this region, so this gets raised to the power of the number of other sites, n minus 2. Doing a line integral of this probability over the perpendicular bisector gives us the average border length between cells. And since we're also viewing the blue and gold sites as randomly placed, we can add another 4 more integrals in front ranging from 0 to 1 to account for all possible x-y coordinates of each site. We almost have an exact formula. Now we can reason about a cell's perimeter, which can be broken up into two parts. The part on the border of the unit square, and the part that borders other cells. The former could be zero, if it's surrounded by many other sites. But once again, all cells can be viewed as equals. Any cell takes up, on average, 1 over n of the perimeter of the unit square, which is 4, giving us 4 over n. For the latter, there are n minus 1 other cells, so we end up with n minus 1 times the average border length between two random cells, which is the integral we came up with a moment ago. Putting all that together, we have an exact formula for the average perimeter. It's entirely possible that I've made a mistake somewhere here. Let me know in the comment section below if you catch something. But I think this works. There is a slight problem though. How on earth do we actually solve this integral? For one, it's not even so clear how to parameterize the points on the perpendicular bisector between two sites with bounds that don't use any conditionals. This arises in part because with all the different configurations of how the two sites could look, the perpendicular bisector sometimes spans all the way across the square from one edge to the opposite one, but sometimes only spans from one edge to an adjacent one across the corner. 
This creates a lot of cases to deal with, and I saw some attempts to resolve it by splitting up the integral into many different parts and making use of symmetry. But this starts getting pretty complicated, and ultimately I don't know if anyone was able to fully flesh out all of the possibilities. The second main issue, and likely the more pressing one, is figuring out how to express the integrand, this probability, numerically. If you remember back from just a little while ago, we had a formula for this. We have two sites and some point along their perpendicular bisector, and now we just need to make a circle centered at the point until the edge of the circle touches the sites, and take 1 minus the area of the circle that lies within the square all to the power of n minus 2. This is great and all, but can you find a closed form solution for it? If anyone has these people's phone numbers, please let me know, maybe they can help us out. But in all seriousness, I spent quite a while searching to see if anyone had answered this question before, and to my knowledge, no closed form solution is known. So we can calculate the position and radius of the circle based on the site locations pretty straightforwardly using some algebra, but making the jump from that to what we actually need is much much harder. One really neat thing I realized though, is that despite this integral being very difficult to directly solve, if we accept our earlier approximation of 4 over square root of n for the answer to the perimeter question, then we can do some algebra to show that the integral is very well approximated by the formula 4 over n to the 3 halves plus n. This technique applies to other integrals too, by the way. Essentially, any time you can show that an integral and another expression both represent the expected value of the same random variable, you can say they're equal to each other. There's a famous example of this that shows this integral is equal to the square root of pi. Here's where I, and I think most viewers, stopped with the integration approach as I've described it. Although I did see an attempt to approximate the 5 dimensional integral with a single dimensional one, which seems to also very closely align with 4 over square root of n by the looks of this graph. That same viewer also came up with this insane looking formula for an exact answer when n equals 2 with the help of a friend. I'd be interested to see if you all watching could verify this, as the derivation is not included here. Now on that note, there was one more viewer submission, which if I'm understanding correctly, claims to have an argument that proves 4 over square root of n is the correct answer. It uses a few interesting mathematical techniques, including this thing called Crofton's formula, which is about finding the lengths of curves by projecting them onto lines. Check out this video by What is Math if you want to learn more about that. But I was getting stuck trying to formalize one of the steps in the middle, and ultimately we don't have a rigorous proof yet. It seems like there's some promising material here, so for those of you who are interested, I'll post the relevant information about it in my Discord server, and who knows, maybe as a community we can make it fully formalized. But several of my viewers commented in my previous video, that the best way to find the solution to a math problem is to state that it's impossible. So I'm going to go ahead and say it's impossible. Huge shout out to no name qf 7 lu for being my first Patreon subscriber. If you're enjoying my content and want to see your name appear at the end of every video, consider becoming a member as well. Benefits include special roles in my Discord server, having your name on screen at the end of videos, and seeing previews of upcoming content. I'm starting work right now on some more beautiful topics in geometry, and if you sign up for any tier level, I've made a post where you'll get inside access to it and be able to offer your input before the final cut is released on YouTube. Also, I'm planning on doing a video in the near future where all of my Patreon subscribers vote on the topic. If you want to be a part of supporting the success of this channel, this is the best way to do it. Head over to patreon.com slash purplemindcs or scan the QR code on screen. Every contribution is greatly appreciated, and goes directly towards supporting future videos on this channel. Thanks so much for watching, and a special thanks to everyone who submitted something for this problem. Having such an enthusiastic community of people who are all so excited about doing math is what enables me to make videos like this, and I'm super grateful for your participation. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.